Good morning, my name is Christina. I'm from Edge Homes. Has anybody heard of Edge? One, two, okay, a few of you. Wonderful. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself, bring you some refreshments, get you through class this morning, and tell you a little bit about our community. Ouch, that hurts. Um, <laughs> that, that's what I do. When I'm sitting for two hours, I needed, like, coffee in the middle, so that's nothing against you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you an update on where we are. We have a lot of great communities right now. We have 10 communities between Harriman, Riverton, Lehigh, uh, Orem, and Eagle Mountain and Saratoga Springs. And coming up this summer, we're going to have another five or six communities releasing. So um, we have everything from condos, townhomes, to single family homes, smaller lots, larger lots. Our condos started around 180. Um, they have garages attached, which is really fantastic. Townhomes start around 225, 230. And then single family homes, depending on what community they're in and how much land they're looking for, they start anywhere from 270s, 280s, and they can go anywhere up from that. Um, one of the things that's really important to Edge is that everybody has a really comfortable, lovely home that they walk into. So I try to make sure that all of the standard included features are really nice. Um, but they can kind of upgrade to anything that they want. So they can really customize whatever if they want to move a wall in the floor plan, do anything like that. We really try to be as flexible as possible and help them out to accomplish what their dream home is really going to look like. Um, so that's really all I have. I have some folders with some information on our communities, and um, I have my card staple to it. So if you want to grab some information, yeah. What's like the time frame on? It takes about six to seven months from the time they sign the contract until closing. Um, and things that help that process along are if they stay organized on their end and get through the design center and make their choices, that kind of helps the process along. And once we dig, it's 110 days. So once we start excavating, it's a really smooth process. Any other questions for me? That's a great question. Thank you, Bill. And you pay all closing fees, right? <laughs> You're funny. I wish you brought your bagel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and some coffee. That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning. I really appreciate it. Again, some information right here for you. Enjoy your class. I'm sure this year is really yeah, it's too exciting. Late. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you so much. Enjoy the bagels and coffee. Have a awesome. great day, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. All right, well, good. Let's. Uh, so, if you guys want to grab, it uh, looks like there's coffee and uh, bagels. So, if you want to grab one, have at it. So, um, <clears throat> wins are successes, though. Everybody have a good holiday. And yeah, I had. We had an interesting situation, okay. and I was wondering your advice on how to handle this situation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the situation? Yeah, was I may have been there. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. We um, I think I know now. <laughs> okay, we had a listing appointment, and when we pulled up, he was there. And so, so, yeah. so it was kind of an interesting situation, you know. And then he handled it well. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, but then, okay, like 15 minutes before, another agents uh, showed up. Okay, and. Um, they were calling like every five minutes. They knew we were in here. And they were calling, so we couldn't close. So he said, oh, they're right out the door. I have to go now. And so they entered, and then the two other agents came in. Now, how do you how do you handle that kind of situation? Throw their phone against the wall. So <laughs> that's it. I'm saying just turn off the damn Turn off phone. your phone so they yeah. can keep calling. So. But, you know, it's, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's an uncomfortable situation. He knew that he wants to go with Century 21 because yeah. we were the aggressive ones as all the agents. But, well, I mean, like, that was just, it was hard. To deal Which, with so that. I guess. And what's, also hard for him because we showed up. So, <laughs> Andy, what time was your appointment? My appointment was after my open house. We call half an hour before I came home. So, okay. exactly so you didn't have a set at I didn't have a set time. And then what time was your appointment? Um, ours was at, oh my goodness, what was it? I just, I, oh wait, it was 4 o'clock. And I don't know who the appointment was with after, but I know that there was another agent who was supposed to be in the morning. So the guy can't say no on the phone or something. He yeah. Really walk in like, yeah. Well, so yeah. did they, um, so you, what your appointment was at 4? Yeah. So you got there at 4? 
And then what time did they get? Oh, uh, well, it was it was like 5.45 or something like that. So you were an hour and 45 minutes into it when they yeah. showed Yeah, yeah. You want to hold the whole house? Yes. And show it every day? Yes, it was very long. Okay. The walk, the walk through was pretty Well, so I, I guess my first thing that I would say, though, is that, that having it stretch out for an hour and 45 minutes is part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Meaning, you think you should have cut it short. Using some transitional yeah. statements, things like that to that's keep true. it back on track. So, I mean, that's honestly, I mean, if you were, I was expecting you to say that the next appointment was at 4.30 and I was going to say, okay, well. Yeah, but, yeah. So you should cut it shorter. Yeah, I, to try me, to I would stretch just, it, not stretch it, but try to mm -hmm. go a little faster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure, if, especially if, I mean, that far into it, I just think that would be your biggest thing is yeah. keeping it. A shorter yeah. window. But worst case scenario, I probably would have said, well, we've got some more things that we still needed to cover with you. So what, what time is their appointment at? So when can we come back right after them? Yeah. And then, and we schedule, and then I would have started calling. Exactly. Call. exactly. <laughs> done the exact same thing right back to them. That's exactly what I would have done. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, because yeah. that was a bit of an uncomfortable situation. Sure. But I think that's interesting how we need to, I think that's one thing that we need to remember is just, they like to take their time and just leave the walk. You know, we try to think, but I think we should leave the walkthrough. Do you think that's how you should do that? You know, it's kind of, I kind of have mixed feelings. It kind of depends on the person because, yeah. you know, I mean, you look at our script, the Mike Ferry script says, you know, I want to go through and take a look at the home as if I were the buyer. Yeah. So, Oh. Meaning, I want to go discover it the way a buyer would, not have you pointed out to me because oh, you're not going to be there. Yeah. So that's one thing. Now, the flip side of that though is, though, is it can be a great time to build some connection or rapport yeah. with the people by going through the property with them. So, you know, ultimately, I think probably I would say go through it with them. But then, what you would want to do is kind of keep an eye on time, yes. and saying, hey, you know, we don't. And I wouldn't say we've got to go. I would say, you know, look, I don't want to take, take a tiny time. time of your time, and so. Really, what would be best is if we could sit down and talk a little bit more about what's, you know, kind of just you take them control of things. Okay, that's good. That's good for the minds. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. who got the listing? I think. I think. You think they did? Yeah. The next group? Ooh. The next group Jeff that and came? Rebecca. Oh, yeah. we're the ones supposed to be in the morning. That's when Yeah. Huh. Well, you ought to call to find out. I, 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 well, I tried calling them back. Yeah. Cool. Well, good. What wins or successes? What good things? Give me some good news. What's happened? From the open house. From the open house? Awesome. She's a professional house Oh, yeah? yeah? And you got an appointment. Awesome. Good job. Okay, good. Who else? Wins or successes? What good things have happened? Golden State came back on a 3 to 1 deficit. Yeah, that's true. That's, that was <laughs> My son has been rooting for them big time, so I could care less, but my son was excited. So I know exactly. So good. What else? All right. Do Facebook works. Okay. I um, had some pictures taken over, over the weekend, and because I, I couldn't decide which one I liked, so I posted them on Facebook, and I said, "Vote. Tell me which awesome. picture to use." And in the chatter that happened with these pictures, I had somebody contact me and says, "Do you have a property in nice. this area?" And I said, "I told him I said I'm so new, I haven't handled properties anywhere, but I can." Good. And uh, awesome. so he says they're they're not quite ready to buy yet. They're working on their establishing their credit. They told me what they're looking for, and so when when they're ready, they want me to help them. So awesome. Works. Good job. Congratulations. Good job. All right. Well, good. So um, Steve, I guess you ready? Steve's got a couple minutes of stuff to go over with you. If you guys want this, I'm going to put these over here by the bagels because. Yeah. Anyone else? So, I, I realize this is just a big data dump and it might seem a little bit overwhelming. Um, this is the book that I have as a, a quick reference guide. And this is the abbreviated version for just the oh. FHA. So, and it changes every quarter. So it's a constant evolution. So, you know, I, I, I'm trying to put little hacks on the right side of the screen. So it's kind of the, the little takeaway of the bigger idea. And, and then to make things a little more fun, we're gonna have a, 
uh, test. Oh, oh, by the way, the gal from, from Edge, she was talking about me. She wasn't talking about you. Oh, good. <laughs> so it's to help get you through this presentation. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, but we're going to have a little fun next, on Thursday, kind of reviewing some of the ideas that we talked about. So, I've already gone a minute. So loan limits, uh, it varies by county. So you can see in Salt Lake County, a single family home is $312,800. If you go to that website, you can see uh, you know, the different uh, limits. Uh, you can see that it varies in Utah County, Summit County, it starts out at 600,000. Um, credit, we can go down to 500 with 10% uh, down, down to 580 with 3.5% down. We can do a no credit score loan. We just have to build a non, non traditional credit file. Uh, medical collections generally don't count with FHA loans. Uh, judgments and liens, they need to be paid off or in a, uh, some type of payment plan. Do you have these questions? I just wonder, do you guys have this information like on your website? I can, yeah, I can put it up. I'll, I'll find a way to make it so that you guys can access it. Because when you go through it, it's, it's, so it's that should be, yes, and it would be nice to be able to go Yeah, for sure. Uh, job history just needs to be, a, it doesn't have to be consecutive two years. It just needs, like if someone took a break from college or went on a mission, as long as we have a two-year history. Um, Self-employed, generally, it's a two-year history. I just closed a trucker who uh, was a trucker, started his own business, and really used 14 months of his income. Uh, I, had a, I had a person who did, uh, made tortillas. So we were able to, it, it was piece rate. He got paid so much for how many tortillas he made. So it just varies. That's it. Three minutes, four seconds. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I'm going to post that I'll figure out some way to do that. You know what, actually, I was thinking maybe what presentation is if you just had, if you could bring maybe just a printout yeah, that has yeah. the best and you can build stuff like on it, and then you can just, yeah, that way yeah. as you, every time you can give them as you go through just a little bit of stuff. That you can yeah, I could do that. Okay. That would be great. Any other questions? Okay, good. Any uh, any other just in general questions? Anything before we jump into what I've got uh, planned for today? The next division, new agent training, is Monday and Tuesday. The 12-hour new agent? Is that what you're talking about? Okay. That doesn't happen again until August. Oh, is it Monday, Tuesday? Monday, Tuesday. So how much is that going to cost? I have no idea. It's like a hundred bucks, I think, or something. So I am actually certified to teach that. I just haven't actually scheduled it yet. So that we need to do that. So, here? so if you don't want to spend the hundred dollars, be patient. Yeah, give me. I'll. I will get it scheduled right. to do it. In fact, okay. maybe what we'll do is do that. Uh, Set a date. Yeah. Twelve hours. It's 12 hours. So probably what we would do is find like a Thursday and a Friday. So I just need to look at the calendar. And then maybe we'll change one of the classes and do a all day Thursday and all day Friday kind of a thing. That's what we would. We could all bring food. Yeah. yeah. We could do potluck. Yeah, we could do that. So, so anyway, if you don't want to spend the money, I'd say wait, and we'll get it scheduled in uh, in the next uh, within the next month. Well, and a half. What kind of things do they go over? <laughs> Uh, so the kind of stuff they go over is, is a lot of the stuff that we cover in terms of our the Repsi workshop class, the buyer packet, the seller packet. So the idea of it is what happened is years ago, and when I say years ago, meaning like five, six, maybe even <coughs> seven years ago, something like that, the division noticed that most companies don't do any type of a training program like what we're doing for you. And so because of that, they established this. These are the things that an agent needs to learn in their first two years. And really another way of saying that is they realized that in real estate school, they really aren't teaching you how to do real estate. And so they came up with this like 
we need to make sure that these agents learn some of these core things. Some of it is a review from real estate school, but um, anyway, so that's kind of the background of it. So ethics, um, communication, contracts, CMAs, stuff like that. I'll, honestly, a lot of the stuff we already do. So, uh -huh. so do you have to do the other one too? Mm -hmm. The division requires you to do that. So the other thought that I've had, in fact, maybe for us, I could do this. Maybe that's how I could do it. Is we'll, we'll, I'm going to sit down and figure it out. Is really anybody that has attended any of the, like this, our CMA class would cover about two hours out of that. Well, so good. maybe what we could do is, let me take a look at that. So I would just have to make sure that you had attended those other ones and then each of those could count towards two hours of our 12 hour oh, engagement class. So let me take a look at that. We may be able to actually crank it out where we actually just do kind of a one day thing because we have already covered the other pieces. Gosh, I'm glad you brought that up because I have an ethics class at the board on Thursday. Uh, I'll, I'll be there. there. I would have spaced it. Hours. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Okay. So if you don't want to, you, you're welcome. If you want to spend the $100 or 120 or whatever it is, then you can do that. Otherwise, we'll uh, work it out here. So, right. Sound good? Okay, what other questions before we jump into today's class? All right. It's either you don't know what you don't know, or <laughs> you guys got it. All right, so here's what we're going to do. So today we're going to, the name of this class is Activities Management. The idea of this is really, is it's a time management kind of a thing is what we're going to do, but I'm going to approach it probably different than any way you've ever heard it approached before. And and so um, and, and we're going to then apply it then to re really in terms of real estate. So really when we're talking about time management, I want you to look at the activities, which is why we're calling it activities <coughs> management. Look at the activities that you do in real estate and making sure that you are managing those activities to work to your best interest. And um, so, but to get into that though, I got to start with some really kind of some, some, uh, I don't know if basic is the right word, but maybe some background or some foundation in terms of like kind of where some of this came from. Okay. That's correct. Because I suck at this. Okay, good. So I, my, the problem is I have it on my computer and was trying to get it connect to the Apple TV and it wasn't working. So I'm going to have to write some of this <coughs> up here for you is, since I know how much you guys like my artwork. So anyway, this, what, where we're going to start with this, what this uh, chart I'm going to create for you here on the board here in a second was um, done by a guy by the name of C. Northcott Parkinson. Anybody heard of him? <coughs> yeah, and only because you've been through this yeah. class before. Okay, good. So who, so let's see how I good don't you remember. remember anything about him. Okay. So C. Northcott Parkinson, he actually was working on his Ph.D. thesis. This is back in about 1930. Okay, and and it's not important that you have this this piece of it, like who necessarily who he was, but but what he came up with is what I want you to really make sure you get. So he's working on his PhD thesis back in the 1930s, and he was doing a study in the port of Southampton. He was studying the naval shipyard. Yeah, see Northcott Parkinson. So he's studying the ships in the port of Southampton, and here's what he found. So in this is the year. So in the year 1914, what he found is the number of ships, these capital ships that they had in, in commission was 62. The numbers of officers and men in the Royal Navy. So again, what he's studying here is the Royal Navy. What he found is at that time there were 146,000 men, so officers and men in the Royal Navy. Dockyard workers was 57,000. Like I said, this, if you want to write this down, you're welcome to, but you don't really need this. I just want, it's just to kind of show you how he came up with what he did. And then officials and clerks, so these are officials and clerks. What he found was there were 3,249, and then the admirals, so basically the, the very highest up officials in the Royal Navy, there were 2,000. Okay? Now, then what happens, fast forward 14 years, what he found is in 1928, the number of ships that were in commission, so they had gone in, in this 14 year period, they had gone from 62 ships down to 20. Wow. Okay. Now, what happened with the officers and men in the Royal Navy <coughs> was that went down to 100,000. The dockyard workers 
went to 62,439. The officers and clerks went to 4,558. And then the admirals went to 3,569. Wow, interesting. So, yeah, just to kind of show you. So the number of ships went down 67%. This went down 31%. 31 and a half actually. This went up 9.54%. This went up 40.28%. And then this up 78.45%. So what happened? Ships got bigger. I'm not sure I understand. Did you say that again? <laughs> I didn't hear you. Say it again. The ships got bigger. Yeah. No, actually, that is, that's not what it, the ships didn't get bigger because look, the officers and men in the Royal Navy actually went down. I mean, so I guess it's possible the ships got bigger, yeah. but the number of men working on those ships also dropped. You know, the ships became, became more efficient. Yeah. Okay, probably. But here's what happens: is look, so the number of ships goes down 67 percent, but the bureaucracy went up. 128 percent up red over that time. Red tape. Yeah, it's all the red tape, Tim. What? I was going to say we needed 500 people to calculate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now, if you're not careful, though, in your real estate career, this same type of a thing will happen. This happens really, essentially, this C. Northcott Parkinson, he is, in, in a lot of ways, was kind of the creator. This was kind of the birth of management science, meaning in terms of like companies taking a look and saying, okay, how do we become more effective and better at it? What he found is unless it is managed very, very closely, over time, any organization, and since you guys are running a business, your business as well, although yours is going to be not necessarily in terms of people, but we'll get into that in a minute. But over time, any organization becomes top-heavy if it's not managed very carefully because it's, we, need, we, we need somebody to come and do this. We need somebody to come in and, and teach that or to be in charge of this and to be in charge of that. So over time, what he found is this. Now, from that, what he then did is he created this thing that I want to share with you, is which is called the, uh, work expansion. Okay, so in fact, I, I want you to write this down to be able to have this piece of it. So work expansion, write that down. What he found, which came out of his study here, and that is 1930 thesis while he's working on his PhD, is this work expansion. Work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So, so that's what I want you to write down. It's work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So what does that mean? You stretch out what you have to do. If you have like nine five, like we'll stretch down to five. Perfect. Yeah. If you decide I'm going to go, I'm going to be in the office today from whatever time until whatever time, you, work will expand to fill that time available. Now, so really what he came up with and, and what this means for you is there is no correlation between the amount of time that you work and the amount of productivity that you create. So there's no correlation between work and productivity, meaning showing up and being here for eight hours does not mean you're going to be productive for necessarily eight hours as well. Okay, So that was the first principle that he came up with as he worked on his PhD thesis, is work expands to fill the time available for its completion, Okay, which is not the same as productivity. Okay, So the second one that he came up with, the second uh, law that he came up with or principle that he came up with is what he called the law of triviality. So I'm going to write this one down too. So the law of triviality. It looks something like this. If you had a list of priorities, so if you've got a, a, a bunch of priorities, things that you need to get done, and you were to rank them, you know, one to ten, something like that, they're going to look something like this. So so if I've got ten priorities, this one being the most important. This one being the least important item. So what he found is this law of triviality. So is if we had this list of items that were ranked 1 to 10, what tends to happen, though, is we work on them in inverse order.
So this one is still number one, this. This is still number 10 here. So this law of triviality, what he found with that is that we will work on things in inverse order of their importance, meaning we got all these things that we need to do to get accomplished, and what we tend to think is, well, I'll hurry and get done with these little ones first, and then I will come and, and um, work, have all the time left over for this biggest one. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So we work on them in inverse order, meaning we spend the least amount of time on the most important things and the most amount of time on the least important things. Why does that happen? Yeah, it's easier, and work expands to fill the time available for its completion, meaning we would rather spend the time doing these things because it's easier, and, and, and I'll actually get into a little bit more of that here in a minute, but we're going to spend the most amount of time doing these things. Now, the, an example that uh, came out of this, the uh, Wall Street Journal did a report, and I'm not going to tell you the name, and, and so... Jesus and Andy, if you remember, don't. I'm getting older. Enough. Okay. Well, don't, if, if it comes to you as we're talking, don't shout it out, okay, what, what it is. But so the Wall Street Journal did this uh, study. In fact, I almost just said the name of the study, which would give the whole thing away. They did this study where what they did is they went in and did a study of the Boston School District. And then they do the study. They then report about it in, in the Wall Street Journal. And, and this actually, which is a great example of this, this law of triviality of how we work on things in inverse order of their importance. And so what happened was they go in and do this study. Now, what happened in this meeting is they had two items on their agenda um, on this, this school, for the school board. Okay? The first item was a um, $200,000 item. I don't know if this is exactly right, but it's close enough. The difference between the high bid and the low bid was $10,000. Okay. The second item on the agenda was a $1.5 million annex, and the difference between the high bid and the low bid was about $200,000. Okay. So on this agenda, now, and if you will watch this, what, what we're going to talk about, you will see this take place almost on every meeting you ever go to. Any meeting that you go to that they give an agenda, you will see they do exactly what we're going to talk about, unless somebody really understands this principle, this law of triviality, and does something about it. Okay, But if not, you will see this, and you probably have been guilty of doing it as well. So they have these two items. The first one being a $200,000 item. The difference between the high bid and the low bid is $10,000. The $1.5 million annex, meaning they're going to be building a new building right here for at the school. It's going to cost $1.5 million. The difference between the high bid and the low bid is $200,000. Now. Here's what's interesting. It was a one-hour meeting. It went. They spent 57 and a half minutes talking about this item. They then spent seven and a half minutes talking about this item. So the meeting went went over, but they spent 57 and a half minutes talking about this item, and they chose the low bid. This one they spent seven and a half minutes chose the high bid. Now. This will give you a lot of insight into you and what goes on with you and where Kevin, where you said I suck at it. Maybe this, I don't know for sure if this will help, but it may. But here's the question. What were they talking about? What do you think this item was? And this is where I would say don't shout it out. If you're, do you remember now? I think so. Okay, don't say it. So what do you think they were talking about? So they spent 57 and a half minutes talking about this item. This is a school board to save $10,000, spent seven and a half minutes talking about this annex, this building, and they spend an extra $200,000. So what were they talking about here that saved $10,000? I meant teacher's wages. Wasn't teacher's wages. Place structure. Was, what? Place structure. Nope, wasn't a place structure. Think simpler. Simpler. Related maybe, but simpler. <laughs> I'm just kidding. A kitchen? Or? Nope, simpler than a kitchen. Looks simpler. Coffee pots and simpler. Paper clips. Simpler. Oh, um, how about cups and spoons? You're getting closer. No. No. Paste simpler than paper clips. Air. I'll, I'll give you the initials and we'll see if you can figure it out. Toilet paper. <laughs> Kidding? They spent 57 and a half minutes talking about toilet paper and saved $10,000, but 
but then chose the high bid here. Now, why would they what, what, stop and think about it for a minute? Because this really will give you a lot of insight into your own business and how you work as well. Why would they spend 57 and a half minutes talking with, now, some of you won't get this, but some of you will be old enough to remember that they spent 57 and a half minutes squeezing Charmin. <laughs> do you remember that commercial? Yeah. Okay. So why would they do that? Because it's all politics. I don't know. It's easier to talk because everybody's focused. Okay, good. Say, say more about that, Sue. I would know. I'd be able to talk about toilet paper. <laughs> we can all talk intelligently about toilet paper, right? Because we're familiar with it. We're all familiar with toilet paper, right? So we could we could all go to it now. Stop and think about who makes up school boards. Parents, realtors. <laughs> yeah, just everyday people like you and me, right? This this isn't people who have gone to school to learn about building buildings and understanding codes and the uh, earthquake um, seismic stuff for the for the building. So what happens is we trust that the person who's got the high bid is going to give us and do a better job, right? Is what their thinking probably was. But yet we understand toilet paper. We can all argue effectively that. So this same thing actually happens with each of you in terms of your real estate career. Meaning, work expands to fill the time available for its completion. We want to spend the most amount of time on the least important things and the least amount of time on the most important things because... It's familiar. It's familiar, the things that we're familiar with. Okay, so I, I, we're gonna, I'm going to pause for a minute on that and talk about one other guy, and then we'll come back to, to this study here. Okay. So um, you've all heard of the 80-20 principle, right? Everybody understands that? Who was it that came up with that? His name was Vilfredo Pareto. Vilfredo Pareto, he was an Italian economist. Okay. And, and what happened is he was doing a study of these factories. And what he noticed is 80% of the production came out of 20% of the factories. And 20% of the production came out of the other 80% of the factories. Interesting with that, Vilfredo Pareto coming up with that, in terms of real estate, this is very applicable to real estate. In terms of just about any company I've ever seen, 80% of the production comes out of 20% of the agents. 20% of the production comes out of 80% of the agents, meaning there are a few agents that are very productive and make a ton of money, and there are a lot of agents that aren't very productive and don't make very much money. So part of what I want you to think of is in terms of who do you want to be? Do you want, do you want to be part of the 20% or do you want to be part of the 80%? And, and then we're going to get into today some of the how do you do it and how do you make sure that you are spending your time doing those type of things. Okay, any questions so far? Let me look at my notes here. So think of a question while I look at my notes. None? All right. Um, here, here's one other piece, too, that I want to show you. Then we're going to jump into this here. So this is the energy curve, okay? So your production looks something like this, meaning in terms of of what we're going to talk about today is not linear, meaning like the slope of this curve, if you notice, yeah, what happens is the further this way we go on this, the, the faster it starts to climb, right? So that, which is, which is the energy curve as well. So what, what happens with you is, and, and, and I spent some time studying new agents for 12 years, and, and I used to actually for a long, long time, you guys should be grateful you got me now versus when like I first started training this because one of the things that I used to do, in fact, maybe we'll do it. <laughs> what was that about being lucky? Yeah. No, it actually is a good experience. So maybe I'll have you guys do it this next week. Can you tell us? Yeah. What happens is, is most agents will spend their time between 7 and 10% productively. Now, not new agents, this is most agents, meaning productive agents, seasoned agents, maybe I won't say, well, productive, I'll even throw in productive. They are only productive with their time, 7 to 10% of their time spent, meaning out of, if out of 100 hours, 
they really are only productive seven to ten hours out of that hundred hours that they work. <laughs> you think you're better than the well, 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 we'll find yeah, out here. So, and in fact, so one of the things which is where I was thinking of what should I have you do it or not, one of the things that I used to do is have agents keep track of their time. So I, I think I'll get, have you guys do that over the next week between today and next Tuesday when we meet. I'll have you keep track of your time and let's see where you end up in terms of productivity, how, how you spend your time. Because most agents are going to only be 7 to 10 percent productive. So being new agents, I, my guess is I would expect you to probably be even less than that in your productivity. Now, here's what's interesting though, is the top, top agents, meaning agents that are making half a million to a million dollars a year, really are probably only spending about 33 percent of their time productively. So if you stop and think about that for a minute, really what I'm saying when I show you this curve is going from 10 going from 10% of productivity to 20% productivity is not going to just double your business. It doesn't double your income. I mean, if you could go, if you could spend instead of 10 going to 20% in productivity, meaning so again, back to that 100 hours, instead of just doing 10 hours being productive, if you could do 20 hours, your income goes up drastically. It's not going to go from say 100,000 to 200,000. Doing going from 10 to 20 takes you from 100,000 to 4 or 500,000. It's a four or five time return on your investment in, in your productivity. So what I want you to see as we go through this and we talk about it is that being just a little bit more productive has a huge impact on your income and how much money you make. So which is why I say if, if you, in fact, what happened when I first learned this, I, I learned this back in 1997, it was the end of 1997 that I had this experience I'm going to share with you, is I had gone to a training where the guy taught this, and, and what happened though is he then had me, I won't have you guys do it this detailed, but you could if you choose to, is what he had me do is he said, I want you to keep track for the next week of your time every 15 minutes. Like every 15 minutes stop and write down what did you do in the last 15 minutes. Which your initial thought to that, or at least mine was, is like well that doesn't sound like a very efficient use of your time, right? But so what I did, I had a, a watch that I wore, it's an Ironman triathlon watch that has a timer on it and I set it when I would get to work. I didn't do this like outside of work, this was just for work. So what I would do is I would start the timer on that. So like the moment I walked in the door at the office, I started the timer. And then 15 minutes later when it beeped, I would go and write down, like let's just say it was you know 8 o'clock that I started. At 8.15 I wrote down, what did I do in that 15 minute period? What, what did I spend that time doing? And then at 8.30 I did the same thing. I came back over and said, okay, what did I just do in that 15 minutes? And did that the whole time that I was quote unquote working and kept track of it for a week. Now, here's the thing. So I'm going to ask you guys to do this for the next week is to keep track of your time and, and at least at a minimum do it at least every hour, but probably every half hour would be even better. But if you really want to know where your time goes, do it every 15 minutes. So what happened though is I started tracking it. And, and after a week of doing that, went back and reported on to how I was doing it. And guess what? My productivity was somewhere in this, this range, which my income kind of showed that as well. But um, as I kept track of that, though, it, it, it does a couple of things for you. One is when you know you're going to have to stop and write down what you're going to do, it all then starts you have to, do to, to make something to do. <laughs> exactly. It, it has you create something, right? So. Um, as I did that, though, is it really helped my productivity in terms of what I was what I was spending my time doing. Now, let me tell you though, the 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 flip side of that though is, I had at one point I had gone into oh let me back up doing this for one week is not going to like tell the story though meaning like you got to do it one you may have one week that's just either a really good week or a really bad week but if you would do it for a whole month. So I won't ask you guys to do that, but, but if you did it for a whole month, 
it gives you really, really good insight. In fact, one of the things that I would tell you in terms of if you came to me and said, Russ, I want you to coach me and, and help me to figure out how to make two hundred and fifty or four hundred thousand dollars. The first thing I would do to tell you then, Andy, is I want you to do this every day that you're working. Keep track of 15 minute increments. And then at the end of the and I'll show you how you're gonna classify it here in a minute. But I would have you keep track of it and then come back. Because here's the problem for me. Unless I know where you're spending your time, I don't know how to help you fix what the problem is. But this is very, very telling. If you keep track of this, um, and what I have you do is put it into three categories, which we'll get into in a minute, which is going to be our appointments, prospecting, and then what I would call non-productive time, just time that is not going to be... Now, non-productive, I'll, I'll say more about this, but non-productive does not mean not important. just means it's not actually productive. In, in your time. So uh, this may be a very subjective question, but is there a magic number to shoot for? Yes. Great question, actually. So um, I'm going to put it on the table for okay. a minute. Okay. We'll come back to it. First, I want to get, once we get into it, I'll show you what you want to have that look like. Okay. Sound good? Sure. Okay. So, but now before we get into that, which we're going to do that, but before we do, I want to come back to this study. <coughs> Why would we spend this time doing this versus Spending the time here, I told you already, do you remember? Familiar already. Yeah, it's what we're familiar with. It, it's easy to do it because we're familiar with the toilet paper. So in terms of real estate, let's come up with, in fact, let me uh, clear some of this off here. What I want to do is let's make start making some lists here of, of what are some productive things we can do and non-productive things we can do, okay? That's why you're doing that. The yeah. 15 minute time increments. Yeah. Uh, Cardone is a big proponent of scheduling your time every 15 minutes. And I tried it a while ago. And I mean, it, it does give you insight into knowing how much you don't. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, so yeah, let me finish that. So what happened with me was I was keeping track. I had gotten a listing one day. I walked over. We had the title company that was in, a, in uh, the building we were in. So you walk through a door like that, you're into the title company. So I'd gotten a new listing. I went over to the title company to turn it in. Um, some of you met Jeff that was here and taught the title class. I, I went, went to his office because he was the escrow officer that I used. So I walk over there. I sit down. Jeff and I, I have a son that's 20. He has a son that's 20. So we have, two, we have boys that are the exact same age. So we've kind of lived... Um, parallel lives, so to speak, with our boys. As far as the sports they did and everything, they've all been kind of the same. So I walk over to Jeff to say, hey, I got a new listing. Let me give you the information to order the preliminary title report. So we sit down and I'm like, hey, so what was going on with Dallin's blah or whatever it was? We sat and then talked about his son and mine and what was going on with different things. And, and all the while, my watch is beeping every 15 minutes because the timer would just beep and then it resets and starts over again. So every 15 minutes it's beeping and I just kept talking. Well, Jeff knew what I was doing so he wasn't like wondering why is your watch keep beeping? So it, it would beep and go and then it would beep again and be in. So we sat there and we talked and talked. We got done. I went back to my office and the next time it beeped, now I had to stop and write down what did I do in that last 15 minutes or since it beeped. When I looked down to fill it out, Guess how long I had been over talking to Jeff? Hours. Longer. Two hours. I was two hours. Wow. So now, had I not been keeping track of my time though, and if you would have said how long, I, Brittany, I or Brandy, sorry, I probably would have said I was there maybe a half hour, forty-five minutes. I mean, I really didn't think I was two <coughs> hours, but I had spent. And for me, that was when this whole thing like came very clear to me. As much as I like Jeff, and he's a good friend. Would I rather spend two hours sitting there visiting with him or have done my work and just gone home? So for me, that's where everything kind of clicked on to me like, okay, that's, I need to change something. Okay, so let's go through this. So in terms of, um, I'm going to call this non-productive. Now again, that does not mean not important. Non-productive is not necessarily not important. There is actually a fourth category that we're not going to get into, but that would be a counterproductive. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to get into that. So, but so non-productive. So so 
Well, in fact, let's do this. So, so I'm going to make the, all three of the areas. So I'm going to call this uh, prospecting. And over here, we'll call appointments. As far as taking classes and... Perfect. That's right where I want to go. Okay. What would you consider that? Okay, good. So what, being here sitting in class for you guys, what would you call that? It's not productive. Yeah, really? I would class, again, that doesn't mean not important, but I would put that right here. Okay. Classes. It would be non-productive. Because here's why. If all you ever did for your whole career is show up to classes, right. how much money are you going to make? Yeah, zero, right? So it's not, that's why to me I would classify it as non-productive. Now again, that doesn't mean it's not important because, you know, in terms of Stephen Covey, you got to stop and sharpen the saw, right? you got to spend some time sharpening the saw. But I would classify that as a non-productive activity. So in terms of that, let's, so what are some of the most familiar things that we could do in real estate? So give me some of the things that for you guys would be familiar. Now remember, going back to this toilet paper study, which that's what they called it in the Wall Street Journal is the toilet paper study. What would be some familiar things that you guys could do? Obviously class is one of them. Well, I, what else? I, I just call fizz bows all the time. And, that, and that's familiar to you? Yeah, that's familiar You're comfortable now. and you... I'm comfortable now. I'm trying to... I have the appointments, but it's just now closing is now the challenge. Okay, so I'm going to put that one over here, but I and I would argue with you that it might be comfortable for you now, but how many of the rest of you is it comfortable for? So it's good that it's you've made it comfortable, but what are the things that don't give you any like anxiousness in terms of real estate? So give me some other things, activities that we can do. Working on the MLS. Okay, good. MLS. Somebody on the back row, Rob. I'm just teasing. <laughs> That's comfortable and and. Okay, and you're familiar with it. Okay, I would st I, I would throw it over here. Again, I would argue that it, it's great that you and Natalie have gotten to that point. We all want to get to there. We need to. But typically, that's not something I would classify as something that I would say that is comfortable for most people. So it's good that you are. So what else? Come on, give me some more things. What do you guys do? What do you spend your time doing? Tim? I guess, you know, under non-productive, if it's putting together your buyer packets. Okay. I'm just going to call that paperwork. So good. Reading books, doing stuff like that. I don't know if that's a class. Absolutely. Books. I'm talking to Andy. Talk, yeah. <laughs> that is not productive. Uh, here, I'll, I'm going to call that, I'm going to call that one so lunch, much. right? Because <laughs> yeah. that, for, for me, and, and even still, like, you know, it's like, what are we doing for lunch today? Networking. Okay, good. Yeah. Showing homes. I love to show homes. Okay, showing homes. So now on that so what, one, what would you consider this? I, I probably would kind of put that one in the middle. Okay. Well. Or is that like open houses, showing homes? Let me see. Where would you put open houses? I might have an open house here, but I, I'm yeah. showing homes. And I, I just love it. I'm going to put showing houses over here in between these two. Okay. And I'll explain why. Okay. Um, what did you say? Open houses. Open houses, so I would say, I'm trying to drop that one in between here. Here's why. The reason on this I would put this in between is because it depends on how you do it. Right. If, well, we if you do it, you what? We did one this weekend. We had out fired and knocked and called, and, but Memorial Day weekend or whatever, we had one. Yeah, so depending on what you did during the time that nobody was coming through, I would either throw it over here or over here, depending on what you did. So yeah, if, if what you did is sat around and visited, then I would throw it over to here. So that's why I kind of throw that in the middle. If what you did instead is jumped on and made calls and SOI calls or something like that, then I would put it there. So good, what else? How about, um, you know, like those videos, just watching videos, I'm really bad at that. Uh, like what kind of videos? You know, just like how to make a Bizbo call. Oh, okay. Yeah, so all those kind of I'll things. just call it training down here. Yeah, so it's probably kind of videos. the same thing as classes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, what other things are we familiar with in terms of real estate? I mean, we got it pretty close to being covered. But I heard it earlier Facebook, email, 
CMAs, which I guess kind of would be MLS sales type of things, right? Would you consider Facebook marketing and all those types of passive marketing non-productive versus prospecting? Great, yes. So in fact, it, yeah, advertising I would throw over here. I would throw that into the non-productive. And, and I'll explain why I would in, in just a minute. Okay, so now let's go into the prospecting area. So what are the things that we can do that maybe aren't real comfortable for us, but in terms of prospecting? So we've got for sale by owners, door knocking, what else? Just cold calling. Okay, cold call, which it, again, be, just a reminder, just I always point out on that, make sure you're checking the do not call list, right? right? Okay, cold just call. Listed. Okay, just listed or just sold, good. What Expired. Else? Expired. What else? Your team website. That's a lot. So say more about what you mean by that. It's like we get leads off, off of the website. Okay. So it mean calling them. Yeah. So yeah, that the reason I what I sometimes what people do is they'll work on their website over here. So that, that's where if it was like working on the website, meaning like typing in notes or trying to make it look a little fancier, then I would throw it there. If you're um, calling the leads, so I'm going to just put call leads, or maybe we should even just call it uh, lead follow-up. There. So, because, yeah, for sure I'd say lead follow-up. I have a question. Yeah? So, when I'm doing my physicals, I'm writing some of the stuff out by hand. We're working as a team. Anyway, so I'm call, stop, and I'm trying for this 15-minute tracking thing. Would you consider that prospecting time? Not prospecting, because it's kind of... Well, which part? The calling or the tracking? The tracking. It depends on how much... If, if, if the tracking is like as soon as the call's over, just like writing it here's out. what they said, if, how much time do you spend writing it out, I guess, is really what my question is. a minute or two. Hours if it's a minute or two, I would still lump it under this category. Okay. If it's 15 minutes, then I would draw, throw it into this category. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So if it's something, if it's kind of an insignificant part of that 15 minutes, great, put it here. If it's turning into a majority of the 15 minutes, it should go here. Okay. Okay? Good. What else? Was that call follow-up? Yeah, I just, uh, oh, yeah. Call leads. Call leads or lead follow-up is what I call Yeah, good. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Take a message. Tell them I'll be right back with them later. Okay. <laughs> All right. What other ideas? I spent a lot of time just setting up, like, hot sheets. Okay, so I, that I would I don't know why it takes so long because I, I don't play around with it a lot. And so I just have to take a message. My daughter's leaving to Scotland, so I'm just. All right, anyway. Hello? So that's pretty good here. Okay, what what would be, what would then we throw, give me the, what, what would be appointments? What are things we're going to do on appointments? Close the deals. Listing presentation. Okay, good. Listing presentations, good. What else? I was just thinking generating CMAs, but that falls under the list of presentation. But yeah, so I, yeah, I would okay. say probably put it under here, but we could. I'll put in parentheses presenting. That's a little. That's a little nerve wracking to begin with. That's what I said. That's a little nerve wracking to begin with. What generating CMAs? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Got gotcha. you. So, but actually putting it together, I would put over here oh, is when you're creating okay. it. Yes, it might be nerve wracking, but it's easy. To, you know, there's yeah. it's it. Easy to spend a ton of time on it versus the actual presenting of it. Okay, good. What else? What are other? Stop and think about what are other appointments that you'd have. Buyer side. Okay, good. So with the buyer, so I'm going to just put buyer presentations. What about when you meet with the lender and the and the client? So tell me more about that. What do you mean? Meaning like what if we have them come meet with the lender to get pre fall and then you're going with them. Do they ask you to come with them? Would that be part of appointments? Or so actually, if you're going in with them on the appointment, I would put it under here. Okay. Because why? Why you don't, have, you don't need to be you there. You don't need to be there. Is that normal to go in? No. With them? Oh, okay. That's why I would put it over here because really, I mean, it, it's not abnormal either. It's okay, but it's just you don't need to be. There's no reason to be in there, as I would say. So, okay. What else? Uh, so. Okay, so actually, here's how I usually classify it. Technically, yes, it probably is here, okay. but I usually say it's here unless you ask for referrals. Okay. If you ask for a referral, then I'll let you count it over here. All right. So I'm going to 
So good. Closing. Because it's almost after the fact. Did you ask for a girl to ask the settlement? Yeah, absolutely. Because when are when are they going to be typically the very happiest on this yeah. deal? Is right after letter, they've just signed. And, yeah. yeah. So yeah, asking them to write either a letter of recommendation and asking them who else do you know? Because here's the other thing is especially during the whole process of them actually purchasing up until they've purchased really is kind of the ideal time to be asking for referrals. Pretty much every time you talk to them, because what are they doing? Like meaning like as they go out and are just going to work and going to the family functions and to friends, what do they talk about? That's, yeah, all they're talking about is what's going on with, you know, this horrible agent. That, no, I'm just teasing. But they're just talking about all the things that are going on with, hey, we're about, we're about to close on our house. and da, da, da. I mean, other people, oh, we've thought about it. I mean, best time to be doing it. For sure. They're networking for you. Okay, good. What else? Could, what other things would we be doing in appointments? I'll help you out if you need it. You need it? <laughs> Price reductions. Price reductions. Oh, there's a big one. Huge. Good. Let's see if there's anything else we can think of. I mean, really, in terms of our most productive things, which I guess this would be another way of saying it, is this is productive. These are productive things. I mean, stop and think about how much money would you make in this business if you spent a hundred percent of your time either on a listing presentation, out with a buyer, which, oh, by the way, the reason I put showing homes kind of in between here is if you have a buyer agency agreement, I would count it over here. If you don't, I count it over here as you're still prospecting. Until you have an agreement signed with that buyer, you're still prospecting. You're still hoping to get a client. So that's kind of why I put that in the middle here. But so what if you were out with people who are who have signed a buyer agency? Or or how about if you sat at closings all day every day? Make a lot of would you have would you not make a ton of money? Oh, yeah. Mike Ferry. That's right. You'd be above him. Price reductions. If you go, if you spent if your whole day consisted of these things, would you make a lot of money? Yeah. So that's why I would say really these are productive. These would probably fall under an indirectly productive, and this is non-productive then, right? So what do all of these have in common? There's one central thing that every one of these has in common. Oh, you're, you're actually with the client. Yeah, you are face-to-face -face with a client in these scenarios, right? So really, the most productive thing you can do is be spending time face-to-face -face with a client. So every one of these people has signed agency with you, and you these meetings, you are face-to-face -face with them. That is the most productive thing you can do. What do these all have in common? Sorry, I'll get out of your way. Okay. Thank you. You're trying to, potential. You're trying to get with clients. You're looking for potential clients. Yeah, we ultimately, uh, yes, you're exactly right. I'm going to say it a little different. Ultimately, the way we get these is through this. Right? That's how we generate then the appointments to, to get in front of the people. So the, this is where I would say it's indirectly productive. So this is our productive time. This is indirectly productive and this is non-productive. Now, which of these is would you say is most important? If I made you guess, which I'm going to. What, like prospecting to keep the funnel full to get to? Yeah, that? essentially, yeah. That's, if you never do this, how many of these are you going to have? Not many. Mm -hmm. you a lot of training Pipeline classes. will dry. Up. That's right. We're in a lot of classes, right? So ultimately, for me, in terms of for, in, for you, this is like the most important thing you can do because it can now controls this. So let me let me show you what I mean. If I were going to put together a schedule for myself, which you should be doing, so let's say I'm going to sit down and schedule out. Okay. Let's put together a schedule for the next week, okay? The first thing I should be scheduling in there is what? Prospecting. Close. First thing you should schedule actually is any of these that you already have. Okay. All right. Because if I've already got it, i got to have those in there, right? But then as soon as I have this scheduled in, as soon as I've scheduled in my appointments that I've already got for the week, so with any buyers or sellers, any of that, thing, the next thing I need to schedule is my prospecting time. After that, then I can schedule in these other things. So why would we do it that way? 
Why would I say to you, you got to schedule this in? Did, were you raising your hand? No, no. Oh, good. Because that will force you to do, spend more time. It's more difficult. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, if, now, here, let me ask you a question. Let's say, for example, let me just, I'll draw out here. Let's say this is a... Uh, one of the days in the week here, we've got our time blocked out here, okay? So I've got my time, this is, let's say it's tomorrow, Wednesday, okay? So I'm prospecting on Wednesday, and I'm, I'm up here doing my prospecting time right here, okay? In the process of doing my prospecting, I come across somebody that, that uh, I've already got an appointment scheduled here, okay? So let's say this is uh, 10 o'clock till noon, this down here is between 4 and 6, okay? So I'm prospecting. I come across somebody that says, yes, Evie, I'd love to meet with you, but uh, can we meet sometime between 4 and 6 o'clock tonight? What are you going to say? Uh, well, is that another appointment at that time? Yeah, you've already got an appointment at that time. Then can we meet at 3? Okay, good. No, everybody would do that, right? I mean, is anybody going to go, all right, I just won't show up to this appointment. I'll go to this other one? No. Okay. What if, well, I'll come back to the what if. Okay, so everybody's good. That's what you would do, right? Now, let's say, though, that here's Thursday over here. Now she's prospecting, and she has scheduled in to prospect right here on Thursday again. So she, she calls somebody, and they say, oh, yeah, love to meet with you, Eddie. Can we do it on Thursday between 10 and noon? You can tell it's a trick question. Huh? I know I feel like you want me to keep prospecting there, but that's not as productive. So, so what would you do? Yeah, I guess I'm trying to be the map here. Can I meet at 12 or 9? I'm going to prospect in the Okay, so how many of you would would ask for a different time by a raise of hands? Okay, how many of you would say, yeah, I'll just go meet with them? Because. No, 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 no. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, that's the truth. I know most every one of you would do that. Now, here's what I'll tell you. If you need to treat your prospecting as if it's an appointment, so you're right, I did want, I want, what I want you to say is, notice if you treat this as an appointment the same as you would this one, meaning, would you ever just not show up to an appointment? So the same thing applies to your prospecting. When you schedule that in, you need to say, I'm treating this like an appointment and I'm going to show up to the appointment. Now, in the event, so where Carrie was going with it, in the event, though, you decide, okay, I am going to go ahead and meet at this time with the person, what do you have to do, Carrie? Just reschedule your prospect. Yeah, so it, it is totally fine to say, okay, I'm going to actually do my appointment here, and I'll move the prospecting down to here. Now, that I'm good with that, provided you actually do it. Now, let me give you a different scenario. So let me, I'm going to come back now, Evie, on this one, okay? So... This appointment you had here was for a $40,000 mobile home. It was a nice one, okay? But while you were prospecting, you came across somebody that said, yes, I want to meet with you today between 4 and 6. Up and out. And it's a $1.5 million home. That's the only time they can meet. And they're saying that that's really the best time for us. Oh, can I try to move the mobile home? You can do whatever you want to do. Uh, so what would I mean, what would you do? Um, this one's a forty thousand dollar mobile home, and they want you want you to do it for three percent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like if, they, if they really if, if the one point five million dollar one really couldn't do another time, I guess I would see if the forty thousand dollar one could do another time. So but notice that I mean, would, would it be okay to call this person the forty thousand dollars and say, hey, is there any way we could reschedule? Right. I mean, now I agree with what Kevin's saying. I mean, we, we should approach it as like, this person is just as important as this one. I'm, I'm all with you. But let's be like honest about <laughs> I agree, it should. But it, when, when it really comes down to it, our first thought is going to be, <laughs> let me see if I can reschedule this one. Which, hey, there's nothing wrong with calling somebody and saying, hey, I've got something that's come up. Would it be okay to meet at another time? Now, the flip side of it is, it'd be also be okay to say, nope, I already got an appointment there, and when can we meet at a different time? So, because there's got to be another time, right? Well, on the on the plus side of doing that and holding fast to treating clients all the same, if you are this way with the $1.5 million customer, 
you say, I'm sorry, I already have a, 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 an appointment at that time, it's going to make them, Absolutely. this person is really busy, they must be really good, and it could cement your relationship with them. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm not saying for sure, I, I'm going to just use this as an object lesson for this one, that notice that you wouldn't be opposed to calling and rescheduling this to another time, this 40000 so my point is, in terms of your prospecting, that's really what the point I want to get. I agree with what you're saying. But the point I want to get across is it's okay to say, look, I'm going to go do the appointment here, but I, that means I've got to reschedule my prospecting for whenever. If you, if you will treat your appointment, your, excuse me, your prospecting as if they are appointments and treat them that way, meaning you would never show up late to this $1.5 million appointment, would you? And hopefully not for the 40000 either. You, you shouldn't be showing up late to these. Don't show up late to your prospecting. You wouldn't show up to an appointment with a client and be like, hang on, let me check Facebook here for a little while. Right? I mean, you'd never do that. Do Treat your prospecting like it's an appointment, meaning be business. Be very um, serious about what you're doing and approach it in a professional manner instead of treating it like Hey, Andy comes in. Hey, do you want to go to lunch? And I'm like, oh, well, I was supposed to prospect, but yeah, let's go. You know what I mean? You would never do that to an appointment. Treat your prospecting the same way. If you'll do that, what you will find is that you will have tons of then appointments that show up as well, right? So now, let's come back now for a minute. In terms of this, so hopefully I've made the point. This is probably the most important thing you can really do. In fact, in, in a lot of ways, I would almost rather you tell this person, no, I can't reschedule, I'll have to do it at a different time because I need to prospect. Because if you will protect your prospecting time, you're going to always have business. You will always have business. If you will disregard it, cast, cast it aside, here's, here's my always my concern about talking about rescheduling, is we reschedule it here, and then somewhere along the way, another something comes up, so we then reschedule this over to here. Well, I already had on Friday scheduled to prospect here. And if you're not careful throughout the whole week, what ends up happening is you keep pushing it right. and pushing it. And then what are the chances that on like Friday you're going to say, okay, I'm going to just prospect from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. without stopping. And not only I don't think it's very possible or realistic, it, I don't think it's really a good thing to do. You need to have some breaks built in there to go walk around the block or go listen to a good song or something that kind of gets your energy and things back up again. So, because if you're not careful, that's what will happen though. You'll end up scheduling, pushing it, pushing it, and then what happens when it gets there and you see like this mountain you got to climb on Friday? So pointing to the last minute to study for a test. Yeah. You're just going to go, work. forget it. I'm just not going to do it, right? Exactly. So, all right. <clears throat> now, let me go back to the question that Kevin asked earlier. So, so what should this look like? What, how, how should your time be spent? Okay, In an ideal world, if we could do it ideal, this is what it would probably end up looking like. Is 33% of your time being spent here, 34% of your time being spent here, and 33% being spent here. Now, keeping in mind that, oh, I erased it already. Top, top producers. Very top producers are typically only spending somewhere in this neighborhood of 33% of their time productively in this area. When you say that, are you including appointments of prospecting together as 33% of their time? Or they're spending 33% of their time only this, in the appointment? Just doing this. Wow. 33% of their time is spent. What do you put your drive time to and from appointments? So, good question on that. Typically, I would say it's going to fall in under here, under this non productive. Because, now again, part of why I say it depends, if what you're doing and following all the laws is making phone calls, prospecting calls, while you're driving, then it can be okay. But, you know, follow all the assist. laws and hands-free and all that. What? I need an assistant. Yeah. Well, so good. that's kind of where I'm heading with this. Now, if you were to keep track, so if you were to do this, now, so I talked about keeping track of your time. If you were to do this for an entire year, at the end of a year, if you had kept track of all the appointments and how much time you have gone on them, at the end of a year, you would be able to take your total income and divide it into the number of hours that you spent doing this, and you'll come up with what your 
billing rate is or what your hourly rate is for real estate. Now, I have an idea of where that is, but what would you guys guess if you kept track of this regardless? I don't even know that it matters too much if you're a top producer or even a new agent. If you kept track of the number of hours that you spend doing this and divided that into the income that you made, how much per hour would you guess you're making doing these type of activities? Probably zero right now. Well, maybe right now, <laughs> but but if, if, assuming you're having some closing. Is that portion of it? Base. Uh, $25 an hour. Yeah, that's what I thought. $25? No. It's like a higher. $50. $150. Higher. Oh, really? Okay. It's gonna, what you would find is you're going to be somewhere between $250 and $500 per hour that you spend in this area. Now, why I want to bring that up to you is I want, because if, if I can get you guys to understand the type of money you make by doing this, it'll encourage you to want to do a whole bunch more of it. And less of this, and I'll show you why. So typically, that's what we have found, is if you were to calculate that out, you're going to, and why would it be such a big spread, by the way, between $250 and $500 an hour? Why is it not less than that? The time. Closing ratios, where you're at with the, who, the price point of the house. That's, that's the reason. It's, it's the price point of the homes, that, of what you're working, is why this varies so greatly between. If you're working mostly the lower end of the market, you're going to probably be making $250 an hour that you're doing that, versus... The upper upper end, you may be closer to five hundred dollars, and maybe even a thousand dollars an hour, doing that. Now, typically, what I found is whatever your income is here, if you were to divide that in half, is what you're going to be end up making here for prospecting. Meaning, when you're on the phone prospecting, if you will keep in mind that, which again, where I'm going with this. As, and the reason this spread is going to be so big is it depends on who you're calling in this in your prospecting. But if at the end of the year you took all the money you made and divided it into the number of hours that you spent prospecting, it's going to come out somewhere into this neighborhood. Okay. Now, all of this stuff over here in this non-productive, how much do you think per hour that stuff is worth? Well, I see, well I mean, sorry, I probably didn't word that right. Yeah, meaning like if you were to hire an assistant, as Andy said, what would, how much would you have to pay somebody to come and do all this stuff per hour? Pay someone to do all this stuff per If hour? you were going to hire an assistant to come in and do this kind of stuff. 15 bucks at the high end, I would think? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I, typically I say somewhere in the 12 to $15 an hour. So stop and think about it for a minute. When you... Now, don't everybody get up and leave, though, after I tell you this. If you stop and think about it, like sitting here in class, you're making the, even though it's important, you got to learn the stuff, essentially it's, it's making you 12 to $15 an hour. Doing MLS stuff, your paperwork that you got to fill out, you're making 12 to $15 an hour for doing that kind of stuff. And why I say that is because you could hire somebody. Now, I'm not saying you should. Now, keep in mind... I'm still saying even top producers are spending 33% of their time doing these type of activities. So you can make a very, very good income doing these type of things still. But if you'll stop and think about it for a minute in terms of like, if at the end of the day I kept track of my time, that 15 minute increments, if at the end of my day 100% of my time was spent doing these type of activities, you might as well go get a job at McDonald's because they'll, in fact, in and out Burger, I know, pays $11 an hour. My son, 16-year-old, was about to apply there. $11. I mean, you could go do that and have a lot less stress in your life if you spend 100% of your time doing these activities. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So how do you know when you should hire an assistant? Well, keeping in mind, even talk, becoming a top producer, making $250 or $300,000 a year, you could do that still spending a third of your time doing these type of activities. So it's not so bad. But over time, what should happen is that should grow. So I'm taking a long way of answering your question. Ultimately, what I would say for you guys is these two added together should constitute somewhere around 60% of the time that you spend. So why would we lump those two together 
to say and say that ought to be sixty percent. Okay. Yeah. The reason we jump. Yes, for sure. The reason I lump them together is right now to begin with. For some of you, you may not have any of this going on. And so in that case, if there, if, if you don't have any appointments going, 60% of your time should be spent doing this. Making sure that every day, at the end of every day, however many hours you work, it doesn't really matter. Remember, there's the work expands to fill the time available. There's no correlation between the hours worked and productivity. So if what you did, though, is said, of the hours I worked, I need to have 60% of it being spent doing this, then you'll be okay. Now, let me tell you why. Now, remember I said if I was going to coach, here's what I would do. Is the first thing I would have you do is keep track of your time. Let me show you why that's so important. If I had you keep track of your time, and you were to, if you were to do something that would look like this. So, I'm going to, we talk about TAP in, in terms of um, our listing presentation. You know, thank, acknowledge, promise. This is not the same TAP, okay? This one is going to be total hours. If you kept track of your total hours that you worked, and at the end of a week, or the month, or a year, however you want to do it. But, but at the end of the week, you were to told the number of hours. Let's just, for the sake of ease, say that it was 50 hours here. Okay. Then underneath that, what I want to know is, of that total 50 hours that I spent, how many hours did I spend on appointments? Face-to-face. -face. Remember, that's the what these had in common, that I was face-to-face -face in a selling situation. Another way of thinking about these in terms of this is every one of those you're face to face with the intention of asking them to sign something. I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. When you go on a listing presentation, what's the objective? Yeah. To get them to sign in a listing agreement, right? What's the objective of going out and showing a buyer houses? Get them to sign either a buyer broker or the rep seat, yeah? Um, closings, obviously, they're signing. Uh, price reductions. When you're there, it's to get them to sign. So all of these things, the idea is to get them to sign something. So on these appointments, if I kept track of my time to see, okay, how much time did I spend in this face-to-face -face where I was going to ask somebody to sign something, and let's just say that it ended up being 10 hours here, and then prospecting. How much time did I spend prospecting? Let's just say that it was 10 here. So what does that come out to be percentage-wise? So if I were to do, look at the percentages here, in terms of that, 40% total between prospecting and appointments, right? Which means 60% was what? Non-productive. So really, you don't, don't worry about this column. As you're keeping track, don't worry about what's going on in this column. Meaning, as you're tracking your time, yes, you can write it down as non-productive or whatever. But at the end of the day, at the end of every day, if you're keeping track of your time, what should happen is you should say, how many total hours did I work? How many hours were, was I on appointments? And how many was I prospecting? Because the, the non-productive is everything else. So you'll be able to just know that that one's the default of what's left over, meaning it was 40, or excuse me, 30 hours in this scenario, right? So if you just would keep track of that. Now, what happens though over time? So let's say that I didn't have any appointments here. So I've got the same 50 hours. I've got zero appointments. And I spent um, 30 hours doing prospecting. That would then give me that I was 60% productive there. So 60% of that time was spent there. Now, what should happen though? Here's, here's where I want to go with this. What should happen if I, if I worked 50 hours and I spent 30 of those hours prospecting? What should happen the next week or two? Within the next week or two, what should happen? Lots of appointments. Yeah, it, some of this time, exactly, here, should start to move over to here. So now, now here's why this is so important. If I, if I were coaching you and I saw this week after week after week, it was looking like this, and this, this was either zero or staying very, very low, what would that tell you? And what, what does it tell me? It's one of two things. There's actually only two things it could be. You suck at prospecting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. One of them is, I'm going to say it in a nicer way, but one of them is you're not asking for appointments, meaning you're prospecting, but you're not asking people, when can we get together? Which time is better for you, afternoons or evenings? Guaranteed that it's either that, either 
as Tim said, you suck at prospecting, or the nice way of you're not asking for appointments, or what? What's the other you're not option? Really, be doing prospecting. Yeah, you're lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's either you're lying to yourself that you're prospecting when you're really not. You're thinking you are, but you're really not. Or you're not asking for the the appointment. Okay. Now, what about this? What if on that same 50 hours, uh, I had this type of a scenario where let's say that my appointments were 20 hours and this was, we'll just say 20 hours here. So those two added together are going to be, what, 80%, right? Okay. But let's hypothetically say, so if, if I'm doing 20 <coughs> hours of prospecting and it's generating 20 hours of appointments, that's awesome. Okay, that's great. Very good. But what happens if there's no closings coming out of it? What do we know? One of two things. First one's easy. You're lying to yourself or to me or whatever. You're lying that, that you're having appointments and you're not. Or you're not closing. You're not saying, okay, great. Do you want to write an offer on this house? How soon do you want to get started on, on getting your home sold or whatever? You're not actually closing. Really, it's that simple. This business really breaks down to that simple. First thing is, are you prospecting? If you are, is that turning into appointments? If it's not, I guarantee you it's because you're not asking for appointments. You're not saying, when can we get together? Which time would be better for you? If you are doing that and you're getting appointments but they aren't turning into deals, then the guarantee, the problem is, you're not saying, sign, sign the contract. Yeah? I mean, it really is that simple of a business. So as I'm keeping track, so here's, so again, back to how do you know when you should hire an assistant? Basically, when you are when your appointment time is is taking up a majority of this these two added together, so meaning it's he heading into the fifty percent or forty percent time of doing just that, meaning and you're not getting your prospecting in because you're having to do this stuff, and then in that scenario is when you know it's time to hire an assistant because you're spending so much time doing these activities, you don't have time to get these ones done. That's when you say, you know what? I can make $250 to $500 an hour or $125 to $250 doing this, or I can spend my time doing something I could pay somebody $12 to $15 an hour to be doing here so that I can continue to go and build that. Does that make sense? Okay. What questions? None. Just sounds so simple. Yeah. Well, so that's the thing. Yes, very. This business. One of the things I heard a mentor that I had in this business that is a great, great guy. He's he's retired now, but um, he has. I heard him say over and over. It's a very simple business. It's just not easy. And I would agree. That's it. Is a very. It is very simple. It's just not. How easy is it to get yourself to get on the phone all the time? It's not that it's not easy. It's hard to get yourself. To that's right. Yep. That's, that's the not easy part, is getting yourself to get to go and do it. So, um, with that, let's talk about what should your schedule look like. So, when when if I was going to schedule out my day, when do I start? Like, what's the starting point of my schedule? When I wake up. Okay, Oops, sorry, Carrie. Okay, so good. If it's going to be when I wake up, then when, when should I really start my schedule then? The night before, why? So you know what you're doing the next day. So that I know, because otherwise what happens is I stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning and then I plan to get, because so, if my schedule is to when I wake up, and if I said, okay, I'm going to get up at, you know, 5.30 or Andy, what time? Or 4.30. Or <laughs> why? <laughs> I got all my stuff done in the morning. Yeah. So anyway, um, most successful people wake up during the five o'clock hour sometimes. So maybe you ought to sleep in a little. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> sleep in. That's, yeah, I'll give them one of those. Yeah. 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 So most people wake up in that. I'll say during the five o'clock hour or earlier for you. Okay. So five thirty. What should we be doing? Sleep. <laughs> but if we're awake now, what should we be doing? What kinds of things Either do we need to get done? Reading, getting ready, going to the gym. Okay, yeah, so I'll just, I'm going to throw in there workout, read, 
spend some time, meditate, pray, whatever you want to call it. Hitting the snooze I'm, button. I'm taking a shower. I don't have time to do that. Take a good shower. <laughs> well, then you need to get up at 4.30 with Andy. <laughs> okay, so we do all that kind of stuff between 5.30 and 7.30. What should be happening at 7.30 for those that are in this office, 8 o'clock for the ones that are not in this office? Here. Yeah, be here for morning ascent, right? So actually what I'm giving to you guys right now is, here. this was George's schedule. So if you want to know what he did to be successful, this I'm giving it to you right here, okay? So 5.30, this is the kind of stuff that he would do. Oh, I forgot to put eat in here. You know, eat breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to eat breakfast as well. So eat, read, shower, get ready, work out, spend some time time reading. What would you say, Nella? I just don't can't see how I have to empty the dishwasher, wake up the kids. Okay, so 4.30 for you then. You're, you're with Andy now. You're up Yell at him to get out of the house. Okay. <laughs> they will really appreciate now, it. Now, even with perfect. all this stuff, all that said, though, Natalie is probably one of the ones who I can count on every, almost almost every day, right? Yeah. She's here. So yeah. <laughs> even though she's saying I can't do it, she's here pretty much every day. All right, so 7.30 till about 8.30 is going to be uh, the morning ascent, right? Then what should be happening at 8.30? Training. Run play. Okay, so maybe we do a role play or something a little bit. Oops, role play. For a bit, but by nine o'clock, prospect. Calling FISBOs. Yeah, whatever it is. If it's SOI, FISBOs, expireds, whatever, it doesn't matter. So I was watching a webinar that Red X put on talking about that. They said that the most productive agents from their group start prospecting at eight o'clock. Do you find any credence in? Is it better to start at 8 o'clock versus 9 o'clock? Does it matter? Depends on who you're calling. When you'll do it is the best time. But Depends on who you're calling. So FISBO is expired. FISBO is an expired, yes. 8 o'clock is the time to go. And typically, even calling at 8 o'clock uh, for sale by owners or is the expired? Well, what have you found? How many people have called them before 8 o'clock when you call? Well, nobody. I mean, like. None today, really. Yeah. I got three appointments I scheduled. I called a bunch today, and they were like, no, no one else is calling. Them. Wow. Yeah. I, I got three Yes, 8 o'clock. But here's why I say that. Back when I was doing it, I'm currently not calling any for sale by owners and expires, but when I was, 6.45 is when people would start calling. Well, that's rude. Well, and it's not legal either, but <laughs> yeah. that is what they did. Yeah. 6.30, 6.45 is I what time. 8 o'clock might be for some people. <laughs> What's that? I mean, I, I agree with what you guys are saying. I just found, I found when I was calling, I always waited till 8 o'clock because I'm like, well, that's what the law says, so I should wait till 8 o'clock. Yeah. But I, people would usually, I got a call at 6.45 this morning from on these, where, you know, these expired, so it's typically where I would find that. So, anyway, even for what it's worth. Even at 8 o'clock. Yeah. Do you find any... Do you think it's more effective? Does it matter? When you call? Yeah. yeah. Well, it is kind of the early bird gets the worm, meaning typically for sale banners and expires, the first person calling usually is going to get an appointment. Yeah, I got three. I don't so, have a couple. Today? Yeah, today. Oh, good job. Okay. Well, <laughs> I yeah, seriously. Well, I sealed a deal. Well, I sealed two deals already, but I can sit down here. Well, I... You would be open if somebody wanted to come and listen oh, to yeah, you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah and, and what time do you start? She, uh, right, uh, well, I, I started today right after we're done role-playing, so I'm going to do So it was like quarter to the She really, she really knows. Like, down yeah, come down and be here for Morning Ascent. Um, do the training and then, yeah. Follow me. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. For real, yeah. In fact, what we would love to have, actually, is we would love to have, like, a, at 9 o'clock, like, all of you on the phone up there calling yeah, would be yeah. ideal. Yeah. So, anyway. I miss all of that. Yeah. yeah. Like everything that's. It's, it's happened. Yeah. Well, come spend a day. Come down and just listen and hear. Because I, I was going to say, I know Natalie well enough. She, she yeah, won't care. No worries. Just yeah. don't copy me. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's up here. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> so, okay. So, prospect from typically 11, from 9 until 11.30 or noon. So, like on, meaning on days that we have base camp or sales meeting, usually you want to be done to be down here for that. But let's just hypothetically say till noonish time is prospecting, right? Then from noon till 1, or, or George used to say from 12.30 to 1.30 because 11.30 to 
12.30 a lot of times, a sales meeting or base camp. But somewhere in there, you want to throw in your lunch. After lunch then, from 1 until basically 2 o'clock, should be then lead follow-up. So think of it this way, as in the morning is going to be to generate new leads, and then <coughs> right after lunch I'm going to come back and do some lead follow-up to follow up with and, and um, all the, the leads that I've generated. And I've said this uh, hundreds of times and I'm going to keep saying it to you guys, is the biggest downfall I see with agents is their lack of lead follow up We generate all these leads and then we never do anything to follow up on them. So 1 to 2 o'clock do some lead follow up, from then 2 to 3 and, and I'm going to give you some different things here in terms of for newer agents, but but two to three should be then like prepping for your appointments. So prepping for appointments that you have, and then three o'clock starts appointments. So three, five, and then seven. The way that George did it, and I don't know if I can remember his days, so if one of you guys remembers him saying this, I think he only had one or two days of the week that he would do a seven o'clock appointment. So usually if somebody wanted to do that, I think it was Tuesday, Thursday, he would say, so the, the idea of having this saying, I'm going to do my appointments at 3, 5, or 7, makes it very easy when you're prospecting is to say, well, which is better for you, 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock? And if they said, well, it needs to be later than that, great. I do my 7 o'clock appointments on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so which is better for you? So meaning take control of your schedule and just deciding then, here's where I do my appointments, and then schedule it out. Here's what I'll tell you guys. If you will just make sure that this happens in your day till noon, just make sure that you have a plan every day at least until noon, that you just know exactly where you're going to get your prospecting and do that. If you will do this, everything else will fall into place. Just meaning like, just own like for me, I'm making sure that between 5.30 in the morning until noon is mine. And I'm going to control it. I'm going to stay on track and do those things. If you will do just that, the rest of this stuff will fall into place. You don't have to stress too much about the afternoon piece. Now, let me side note for a minute. Some of the things that you guys should be doing, so for sure this until noon is what should happen. If you don't have anything afternoon in terms of lead follow-up or prepping for an appointment or appointments that you're going on, some of the things that you should be doing then is... Uh, one of the things George talks about when he first started in the business, he would spend this 1 o'clock hour when he had no lead follow-up to do, he would spend between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock writing out the presentation. He would sit down and write it out. Because by writing it out, gets it ingrained in here, right? So doing that. So writing it out, the presentation, is something you could do. The other things that you could look at doing during this time frame as well is um, going out and previewing property. Mike Ferry says for a new agent, you should be pre previewing property every single day. You should be calling up and scheduling an appointment. Now, here's the key. If you're going to preview, you want to call the listing agent. So if Kevin was the listing agent, I'd call and say, hey, Kevin, you're listing over on XYZ Street. Um, I would like to preview that tomorrow or this afternoon between 3 and 4. Would that be okay? Now, if you use the word preview, typically for most agents, they understand preview means I'm not bringing a client, it's just me coming to look. So if somebody ever calls you on a listing and uses that word, I want to preview your listing, it means they're not taking a client, which is important to make sure your seller understands it's an agent coming to look, not somebody else. Because if you don't tell your client there that and they see one person drive up, get out, and walk through the house, like, because how long would it take you to preview a house? Ten Max. I mean, probably less, really, right? And I mean, if you're stopping to enjoy the whatever, maybe it takes 10 minutes. But for the most part, you could be like, especially after you've been through a few, you can kind of go, all right, yeah, standard, nothing new, all right, and bam, you're out. So you want to make sure that your, when it's your listing and somebody says preview to tell the, the client, this is somebody just coming to preview. They're looking to see if it will work for a client, typically is what it means. Okay? So go out and preview some property. But, you, but why would we want you to preview property? I don't want any surprises. Okay, good. Why else? Yeah, essentially it's helping you to kind of have an idea, like when you go into somebody else's home in the neighborhood to do a CMA, 
you've kind of got a little bit of a like, okay, when I've been out and looking at homes in this area, this is kind of the price range. Well, you know, Mike Watts, when we, we had a week to buy a house, and we told them, you know, like a couple months in advance, we're planning to fly, got our house sold, blah, blah, blah. And he, pre he went around previewing a lot of the homes because he knew we had a limited time. And it was quite interesting. Um, we, were, he, we were up on Suncrest, and he said, I want to tell you something. When I previewed this home, it was marble floor, and now it's carpeting. Mm -hmm. Well, because there's a big crack mm -hmm. up in Suncrest. But it was really good that he did that because it saved us time, and he knew exactly what we wanted. Yeah, good. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so preview on property. The other things you could do during this time is um, going out and knocking on for sale by owners or expires, meaning go find some expires that you go out and knock on the doors. And, and it doesn't have to be the expires from yesterday. Look back six months ago or whatever and find homes that expired six months ago that have not been relisted. So the key on that is going through the MLS to make sure they have not been relisted. And then go out and knock on their door. So if I were going to do it, I would go out and knock on their door. Then I would knock three to five doors this way, cross the street, do six to ten this way, three to five this way. The advantage of knocking on these doors is we already know that they've thought about selling. But knocking on their neighbor's doors, if these people aren't home, they'll the, the neighbors will tell you. If you say, who do you know that's thinking about buying or selling, or specifically selling, you know, right now the inventory is really low, who do you know that's thinking of selling? The neighbor will tell you, well, I know they were. Well, what, you know, you can ask, well, when's the best time to catch them at home, and why didn't it sell? And they'll give you a ton of information from the neighbors. So going out and doing some of that is good. The other things you can do during this time here is some role plays. Get with a partner and do some role plays. Deciding, you know, let's practice our listing presentation. Let's video it. You know, if you if you want to video one or something and let me take a look at it, I'll be glad to give you a critique on it. So, but but again, I just want to come back to there's all kinds of stuff you can do down here to be effective with your time, but really own this part of your day of really making sure that if you will do this, actually let's say it this way. We'll go back to Pareto, the little Fredo Pareto. If you could do this 80% of the time, if you had 80% of your days, meaning like so in a two-week period, eight out of ten of the days you did this, you're going to be a huge success in this business. You know, I have done this long enough and watched enough. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you think in terms of why you can't do it or whatever. I have watched people who are way... I'm trying to think of a nice way to say Less it. Skill. Yep, thank you. Less skilled than you guys are. Way, you know, less, I like that, less skilled than you guys are, and I've seen them go out and do it. So I know every one of you can do it. And it but the key to it is, is just forcing yourself, as Carrie said, it's making yourself do this. And, and so part of it, I would say even just find somebody, for me personally, what I had to do is find somebody that I said, let's every day hold each other accountable to prospect. And we would, we would meet at the office, and we would do a little bit of a role play. We would do 15 or 20 minutes of role play, and then bam, we'd go get on the phone or we'd get in the car and go door knocking. And, and we just held each other accountable. And if I ever told Shirley, hey, I can't do it today, man, she let me have it. She was like, you know what? What you're telling me is you don't want any business, 90 day, you don't want any money 90 days from today, is what you're telling me. Is that right? And I would say, no. Well, then you got a prospect. But yeah, but I got this deal. So it helps to have somebody else to kind of reel you in because when you've got a deal, you want to babysit that deal and make sure that everything's okay with it. And Shirley would just force me to, nope, come prospect. Your deal will be fine. It always works out. They always do. Or they don't. But if it doesn't, you'll be grateful because you went and found a new one. So she, I, I would recommend find somebody that will hold you accountable to let's meet. You don't have to go knock on the same doors together, but... Shirley would be on one side, I was on the other side of the street. But we showed up and went out together, and it made it easy, too, when I wanted to just quit in the middle of the time, or she did, the other one would be like, no, come on, let's just stay out here for another hour. So I, I just really think that's kind of, for me, was the secret of getting somebody that you hold yourself accountable to doing the prospecting. And if you'll do this 80% of your time, you'll make a ton of money. So, All right. I'm done unless you guys have other questions. What can I answer for you? Um, oh. oh, yeah, we have to sign Thank you. I have not been good at that lately.
Thank you for reminding me. Going back to last week, talking about the presentation stuff. Uh -huh. This weekend at the Open House, I kind of tweaked my presentation and said, listen, after we're done walking through, I'm going to ask you two questions. A, one, do you want to write an offer or not? They're both important in your feedback. And actually, that, like the second person I talked to, and she just like unloaded on me. We stood there for another 25 minutes or so. At the end. At the end. I was like, come on, sit down. And That's awesome. Uncovered all her reasons why she hasn't bought the past year. So, wow. Is that the one you got the yeah, appointment with? Great. When can we sit down? Awesome. So, Good so, job. Very, Excellent. Good That's job. really cool. It's funny and it kind of takes, uh, not that I'm nervous or hesitant to ask somebody, but it just takes yeah, maybe. pressure off. Yeah. And she was like, oh, yeah, you know, I. Well, in fact, it, at that point, if you don't ask then after you've said that, it makes you look like, well, you know, yeah. I thought you were going to ask me. Why did you not? I thought you were going to ask, you know. So, yeah, good point. Yeah, was funny. Awesome. I've never actually tried that at an open house, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, no, I like a rambler in this. And literally, I was like, okay, hold on a second. Let's sit down and bring good. the table. Awesome. Down, so. Good job. That's great. Cool. Okay. What other questions can I answer for you? Okay. So then I'll give you from last week. Anything else? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for being here. Oh, the first time you said, Next time I will tell you something I forgot. Oh, and, and then the next the time, oh. what was it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I told you to remind me because I knew I'd forget. I'm pretty sure it was the joke. You didn't I say know. it belonged to anything, you just said, Oh, I'll, just finish I'll up tell you that next time. What you're the finishing joke? up a joke of some sort. I'm going to have to go back and watch the video to see what I said. I don't know. Do you think you were talking about uh, benefits? Something about sex. <laughs> no, that was Andy. Oh, okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to oh. watch our in that time. It was a story you had. It was too dirty, I think it was. It must have been. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. I'll have to go back and watch. Do you remember when well, I said so that? We were talking about the necessities. <laughs> oh, the homes. Of people. Mm -hmm. So it's been bugging me for days. Yes, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to see if I can remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to come up? Yeah. Next time I'll say, remind me to tell you why. Because I don't remember what it was now. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Okay. Well, uh, once you sign the roll, thanks for being here. Take some uh, bagels with you. Yeah, I will. Yes, I will. You did last time. Yes, I was just front. I, I, I got attention deficit disorder. So if I don't oh. see a friend, I just go well, uh, Welcome to the world, <laughs> I finally started taking medication for five years ago. Uh, it was the first time in my life you actually. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, I have um, a new agent.